today, where is stress really going to hit? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I'm doing this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined by Steve from Canstar. Hi Steve. Hi Martin. How are you doing? Oh, terrific, thank you. Great Jolly. to be here. Yeah, well, good to have you back on the show again. And look, you did some really interesting research, which I want to explore with you today. As you know, I cover financial stress and mortgage stress in my surveys, but you've done the same thing. And I think some of the things that you're coming up with correlates quite well with I, what I've been saying, but also takes some of the um, information further too. So let's explore it a bit. Yeah, please. So your first observation was that stress is a problem, and we should define how you... Um, talk about stress as well, just to be clear. Yeah, look, to be clear on it, uh, there, are, there are lots of rules of thumb about stress, you know, six, a loan that's six times the, the size of income, stuff like that, and, and then 40% of repayments, all those sort of measures. Uh, what we did, though, is that we said to people, are you stressed? So we asked them the question, uh, and, and, you know, sometimes going back to the source is quite the way to go. And 14% said, yeah, we're stressed right now. And that's now, you know, all right, we've got uh, some petrol price increases but, um, and some cost of living increases, but they're saying we're stressed now. Now, they're not talking mortgage stress, they're talking financial stress, but the mortgage is such a big element of it that you've got to consider the mortgage. Right. So 14% say we're actually feeling the pain now. And interestingly, when I survey them through my surveys, what I find is that the number who actually think they've got a problem is a lot lower than the number who actually have a problem. So yeah. quite a few people yeah. don't recognise that they've got financial flow issues to start with. But as you say, straight from the horse's mouth, there's a proportion of people who know that they've got issues. Yeah, they do. Uh, but uh, come another $100 a week of increases in costs and another 19% say uh, they'll then be stressed. So that's you know $100 more of living costs a week and uh, one third of people are saying we're in stress. Now, it doesn't take much to get there. It takes, um, you know, six interest rate increases. It takes, uh, uh, and that's before you worry about what petrol's done uh, and, and all the other flow on effects from petrol. So, it, you know, it, it, it's a third of people are likely to be in mortgage stress within the next oh, 18 months or two years. Yeah, and that's quite concerning. And of course, one of the things that we should highlight, Steve, is that when interest rates are very, very low, a small increase in the interest rate has a very significant impact on the monthly payment increase that you'll see. Look, it does, Martin. And But, but, but I don't like to talk about the small increase because the realities are that uh, most households, no, 14% can't, but most will absorb a 20.25% or a 0.4% interest rate increase. Uh, the history of rate increases, though, is that after the Reserve Bank moves off the bottom, after it, it makes that first move off the bottom of the, uh, the variable rate, the cash rate goes up, uh, it makes six or eight increases within two years. So uh, you've got to talk about what happens if you're up for, now in this case, 1.65% increase because we're starting from 0.1, not 0.25. Uh, and that's a $400 plus increase in the average loan repayment. That's only a $500,000 loan. If you've got a million dollar loan, then you're really in deep yoga because, because double that number. You're up for near enough five, $900 a month increase in your repayments. Uh, so that's when it starts getting tricky, and you can you can bet that once the move the rate uh, moves, once the Reserve Bank starts the rate movements, you'll see a lot of movements. You'll see you know six or eight of them. Yeah, and the um, forward indicators, if you look at what the markets are saying, is it could be as many as you know three percent in total over the next year or two, right? Now I don't yeah. think the markets necessarily understand precisely what may happen because the RBA might be slow but but you're right we can't just talk about half a percent or you know of 25 basis points this is a substantive move yeah it is it it, it absolutely is and once you start down the path you, you you know they're not locked in because circumstances change but uh, but something uh, you know you, you you will see that sort of move and look don't forget that um, 11 years ago pre-gfc um, maybe a bit more than 11 years ago, rates were 8%. Uh, 
<laughs> now, the average rate now is uh, just under 3%, but 8% rates are just massive um, compared to where they are now. And nobody has seen an interest rate increase for, to their existing loan uh, for 11 years now. Uh, it, was, it was November 2010. <laughs> um, so it's a whole generation of people that will be getting quite a shock when the letter comes to the bank and says, look, you have to pay another uh, $50 a week and then another 50 and then another 50 and then another 50. And so it goes on. And let's just underscore, of course, this is very true for variable rate loans because those rates movements get transferred almost immediately. In fact, <laughs> they don't hang about, do they, the banks? Now, if you're on a fixed rate loan, of course, it doesn't hit you the same way because the fixed rate doesn't get reset until the end of your fixed term period. But if you're on a fixed rate loan, maybe at 1.99 or 2% or whatever, you know, the very best were, next time you're going to fix, it's going to be a lot higher. Yeah, look, most people fixed for three years of the popular term. Uh, people sort of get nervous about fixing for five years because they think, look, situations change. I, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable that I'll, I'll still be doing this in, in five years. Uh, so for three years. Now, to get those best rates, they were about oh, eight, 10, 12 months ago. And, uh, and that means that in two years, you'll be coming off fixed rates. The Reserve Bank will have done all of its stuff and you'll be paying 2% more. Uh, sorry, yeah, 2% more suddenly uh, when you come off fixed. So you've got to start your planning right now. Yeah, and 2% more just to give people a, a, a sense on a, you know, a typical, let's say, 30-year loan, that's equivalent to a 30% increase in the amount you'd have to pay each month. Yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's about right. You, you, you'll be paying um, $400 more, and that's, uh, well, I've got the numbers, but you're, look, you're right, it's about that. Uh, you'll be paying over $400 more on that sort of increase. Mm. In fact, that, the 400 is on 1.65, so it's a bit more than that a year. Yeah. Um, it's, a big, it's, a big, it's a big amount in the, in the budget. And, and, you know, as we've talked about before, uh, it, it puts petrol price increases into the shade. It actually does. It's much more serious than that. And it's coming down the, down the pipe at people. Absolutely. And it's interesting. The ABS published some research today. They interviewed businesses um, across the country and what they expect to do in terms of passing on additional costs to <laughs> their customers, right? And they, uh, the ABS highlighted that a greater proportion of businesses are expecting to pass on higher costs than normal because, of course, they're in turn receiving the same pressures. So, you know, if you think about it, a household who's looking at an increase from the mortgage, an increase from petrol, an increase from other things, wherever you look, these pressures are building yeah. And yeah, they, that's right. And, and it magnifies. I mean, petrol's the classic because uh, petrol has gone up 60 cents or something, $1.60 to $2.20 this year, you know, in three months. Um, now, we, we know why, we know the cause of that is, and we hope that that might go away, but it won't go away fast. And um, uh, so 60 cents. Uh, now, everyone is paying 60 cents on that directly when they fill up their own car but they're also paying on the groceries and everything else they buy. So every business has to move its goods from where they're manufactured or imported and move them over to where they're bought. Uh, and that's built in. So you're paying for it twice. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, 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 it drives a big cost right through the whole community. Uh, plus, there have been all these supply uh, chain pressures that have meant that uh, goods just aren't getting to the market and prices have gone up for that reason too. Uh, so there's a lot coming at people right now. Now, let me go back then to the bank's underwriting, because, of course, the banks are required to calculate repayments on a 3% buffer, right? And yep. they also tend to use uh, a household expenditure measure or some other proxy to work out how much people can afford. So I guess my question to you, Steve, is to what extent do we think that households are actually sufficiently buffered based on those lending standards and the guidance from APRA? Or, or are we going to see a lot of people experiencing a rather nasty shock? Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's hard to make that call because it's a, um, you know, the banks have, have watched a property market go up by you know, 30% in a couple of years. Uh, now, you, you think surely uh, a lot of the loans that have been written in this boom time um, can't afford to pay 
a loan that's 30% bigger than they would have two years ago. Uh, so so you, you've got to think, well, maybe they've been a little bit more liberal in this than they, they could have been uh, just to stay there and in the market and lending money to people that do want to borrow it. Uh, now, they do have to build a buffer in. Uh, they do have to use uh, either the genuine uh, demonstrated costs that people are spending on living uh, or they use a proxy. Now, that's a very controversial issue, but the proxy that you're referring to is the household expenditure one. Um, either way, responsible lending says they must have built that in. Uh, but, you know, there's some ways of kind of um, sometimes taking a slightly more liberal view of it. And I think, unfortunately, there would have been pressure on that in this rising uh, property market to, to get loans away. Uh, we have seen in recent times, though, that they've, uh, they've tended to say, look, there are cheaper prices for uh, low LVR loans. So they're loans where the, the borrower has bigger equity, which kind of um, mm, helps the bank if people run into affordability problems because the bank might not get a write-off, but maybe won't help the people who've gone in with loans that are too big. Yes, and uh, some of my survey responses suggest to me that households you know, weren't telling lies exactly but they were actually encouraged to present their information a certain way and mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. bank tended to go with the standard formulaic structure the the HEM which tended to understate the real expenses and of course the argument is well if you get into financial pressure elsewhere you can cut back but the truth is mm -hmm. can households really cut back when in fact costs of child care are rising school fees are rising you know pretty much wherever you yeah. look yeah. everything is rising so It'll be an interesting journey ahead to see to what extent those buffers that were meant to be there are actually really there. Um, certainly in my surveys, I see a lot of people, when they start to think about it, will say, well, you know, there are a few things we can do in terms of cutting back, but we've already been cutting back. <laughs> so what more can we do? Yeah, look, I agree with you because, I mean, one third of borrowers are telling us that adding 100 bucks a week to their uh, whatever, you know, their, their cost of living is going to put them into financial stress. Now, uh, now <laughs> that says that uh, their mortgage going up by 100 bucks will put that into financial stress, mortgage stress. Uh, so, frankly, they're saying there isn't enough buffer because that's only with a 1.65% increase, not, a, uh, not an increase of, uh, of 3%, which is the buffer. Yeah, so it does beg the question, uh, will the RBA therefore try and drag the chain on, on rate rises because they know that this is a big issue, right? And, of course, mm. we've got a highly leveraged property sector, highly, and we're probably some of the most indebted households globally, uh, if you look at the latest statistics. But on the other hand, the RBA can't ignore the global scenario where, of course, the Fed is now putting rates up, where uh, rates are going up around mm. the world. Uh, and they've also got the inflation genie that is out the bottle here as well. Yeah. So they're going to be caught, aren't they? Uh, look, I said uh, in, right at the bottom of this note, I said that uh, uh, the what, what's happened over the last few months with uh, inflation taking off and with petrol prices taking off the way they have has made the job of the Reserve Bank Governor much, much harder uh, because he's fully aware of the stress that will occur when rates go up and uh, and all of the measures, the, the CPI, the cost of living measures and the budget and stuff, they'll be gone by the time we get to the interest rate levels that we're talking about. Uh, you know, they'll be gone within six months. So they're, you know, one-offs and, uh, and, and the excise uh, will be back up to full tote odds. Uh, so there'll be no help there. Now, what has to happen is wages have to catch up real fast uh, before interest rates start going up. So I think the Reserve Bank Governor has always focused on sort of more underlying measures of inflation, but I think he's going to have to look at wage inflation. And, and, and to a degree, turn a little bit of a blind eye. I don't think we have a blind eye, but, but, but not totally discount, but, but oh, push, push price inflation a little bit to the background. And so we need to see wage inflation because it's not only about containing inflation, but it's also about making sure that we don't plunge the whole financial system into crisis with a bunch of people that cannot repay loans. Yes, and as we know, that tends to have a very negative effect on house prices and it can spread much wider because confidence also erodes. And by the way, household confidence is not very high now. But there's another issue here as well, and that is that um, the banks, of course, still have access to the term funding facility that the Reserve Bank made access to, but they will have to repay that over the next uh, little while, which means that the bank's funding costs 
are already rising and bond rates around the world are rising. So the banks in their own way are also under financial pressure as well to put rates up. Yeah, they are. Now, don't forget, though, that uh, the big banks in particular, but, but banks, period, have a depositor base. And uh, they're paying their savings uh, base rates, their, uh, savings, their savings base rate that's sort of, you know, 0.05%, 0.1%. Uh, so they still have a big bunch of funds that are uh, available at very low price. Now, people will expect more if they see the Reserve Bank rate going up, but, um, but no doubt they'll drag the chain a little bit on, uh, on their savings rates and, uh, and we'll find that they don't go up anywhere near as fast. Uh, so, you know, the big banks in particular, but lots of the banks have uh, uh, less risk there. The, the lenders that don't have access to a deposit base will have to go up a lot faster. And they've been the ones that have been the market leaders in price, the people that are offering 1.79 and, and, and rates way below 2%. They've been the, the price leaders. Now, they might, we might find that they actually have to go up faster uh, than the Reserve Bank. Uh, it remains to be seen, but um, uh, the wholesale rates tend to move more quickly to the natural level than the retail rates that are paid to mum and dad depositors. And it's also worth noting that some of those particular lenders have sought out not subprime but near prime loans, right? Because they had the funding to do it. Yeah, they have, but they've also been. Uh, uh, some of them have also provided those extra discounts for uh, low LVR loans, so the higher equity loans, the lower risk loans. So they, they've been in that play as well. So I think they're, they're, they're very conscious of this, and uh, and you know I think they're professional people. They're not. They're not fly by night as by any means. They've been around for a long time, most of these. But, um, but uh, they will be under much more pressure than the big banks, for example, because of that, uh, that uh, more singular style of, of funding of their book. Right. So let's just then, as we come to the end of this conversation, think about it from a household perspective, right? Ahead, they're going to have to expect that interest rates are going to rise. So what are the things that households should be doing now to prepare for the higher rates ahead? Yeah, if you go on a journey sort of five or six years ago, Martin, and you went into one of the big banks for uh, a loan, they were going to put you into their package loan. It was their premier product. They, that's the product they pushed. Uh, and that's where they were, they were putting you. Uh, you weren't going to brokers any, uh, anywhere near as much as now. It was well, 66%. It was probably half of that. Um, uh, went to brokers. So you're in a package loan. Now, if you've done nothing about your package loan, if you haven't renegotiated with your bank or moved to another bank, uh, you'll be paying well over 3%. Uh, the, the, the highest of the big banks is now 3.85%. Oh, now, the average loan in the market is 2.99%. So this is almost 1% higher. Now, that's a massive penalty to pay for doing nothing about your loan. So, uh, so go into the bank, renegotiate and say, look, you are paying borrowers, you are charging borrowers who come in today this rate for the basic loan. I want the basic loan. Uh, if you can't get it at your own bank, then you'll say, well, I've just got to go to another bank and get that same basic loan. Uh, so you can, you can carve off, that, and they're, they're charging 2.09, 2.19, and the smaller lenders are charging less than 2%. So there are, it's, it's an amazing difference, you know, 1.85% difference uh, from, uh, from one of those package rates to, uh, to the 2% that sort of, you know, 60 loans in the market below 2%. So go and get one of those loans. Uh, but don't change your repayments. Make the repayments you've been making at the bank uh, and get ahead on the loan. Uh, make sure you've got redraw. And, uh, and when the time comes, when, uh, when you have to pay more, uh, you'll be able to say, OK, I can dip into the redraw and then help that to fund my monthly payment. Yeah, so it's about being aware, isn't it? So it's interesting, a lot of people I survey still don't know what their mortgage rate actually is. So, oh. folks, check your rate. <laughs> you know, Go to Martin, Canstow or somewhere else and just check your rate. <laughs> you, you know, it's easier to find your loan and check it on our site than it is to go into your bank's site. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they'll, uh, uh, they'll advertise their best rate very visibly 
but uh, but the other rates are sort of tucked away a little bit, and you've got to sort of uh, really work to find them. Uh, whereas on our side, you'll see them a lot more easily. <laughs> so um, so yeah, you must check your rate because if you're if you're paying uh, more than twenty basis points, you know, 0.2 percent. 0.3% over the 2% line, you are paying way too much. And with 60 loans below that 2%, you're really going to get around about below 2%. You know, you won't get a lot below it with most lenders, but you'll get below it. And it makes just such a big difference. And getting ahead now is the go. You know, don't wait until you're in trouble. Yeah, and I guess the other point more generally is households quite often don't think about all the other money that's going out the door through, you know, wherever, right? And, and sometimes the prioritisation process that they should apply isn't necessarily being applied. So I think the other piece of advice I would make is it's worth sitting down and just making a note of what you're spending your money on at the moment because maybe some of the mm. things you're spending on aren't necessarily the most sensible and specifically look at anything with a high interest rate attached to it as well. Yeah, look, uh, anything um, that disappears as fast as ice cream uh, is uh, is going to is, is spending that you'll regret down the track if you get into to mortgage stress. So what I'm really saying is um, you know, the the discretionary spending that uh, that uh, we all value, it's all part of our lifestyle, maybe just has to go on hold to get that little bit of buffer built up for yourself. Uh, because you're absolutely right. If you sit down and say, look. Here are two lists. The list on the left is the stuff I've got to pay. I must pay these bills. Otherwise, I'm out of my house. I'm being uh, taken to court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're the living, living expenses, the rent, the rates, the, uh, the loan repayments, all that stuff. And this list over here is the other stuff. And, um, and you can afford to live uh, in last year's, last season's uh, fashions. You can afford to do without certain little luxuries. And, you know, the, the cup of coffee is going to seven bucks, apparently, or maybe you can afford to do without that one too. Uh, because uh, uh, seven bucks a day is three, thirty-five dollars a week is, uh, is a couple of those interest rate increases. Absolutely. And I guess the last point before we close is to say that banks do have an obligation when it comes to loan hardship. And yet it's a very hard conversation for many borrowers to actually enter into with their bank. So they tend to leave it way too long and get in deep mm. before they actually have a conversation. So I guess the other piece of advice I would, I would suggest is if you are in financial difficulty, financial stress, talk to your lender very early. Look, I agree because um, if, if uh, your lender finds out you've got a problem when you're three repayments in arrears, uh, they look at it and say, are you fair to, you know, are, are you really trying to solve this problem or are you just uh, hoping to hide it or sweep it under the carpet? They want people who say, look, I know I've got a problem. I know I've got to do something about this. Uh, I'm coming to you now because I need your help right now. Uh, now, they are obliged to help. Uh, they, uh, sorry, they're obliged to give you a good hearing. Uh, they're obliged to, to uh, give you some leeway. They don't want to sell you up. That's the last thing banks want to do. They do not want to sell you up. So, so be, be confident about approaching them. Uh, but a point does come where banks will say, well, look, gee, you know, we've given you leeway already. Uh, uh, and looking at this budget, there is really, uh, you know, it, it, it's a hopeless case. You know, you're going further behind and losing the equity you've already got. Maybe you better be selling now because they have that, that, that hard conversation with people. But not straight away. They'll try to help you first. Yeah, and again, in my surveys, I'm seeing the banks actually having those hard conversations earlier than previously. Um, you know, through COVID, they they bent over backwards and did all sorts of oh, things yeah. to try and help people. I'm not expecting the same degree of support now. Um, maybe other than in flood hit areas where the banks are again showing uh, similar largesse. But that suggests to me that we are going to see more people being pressurised by the bank ultimately mm. to force a sale. So it's not a forced sale, you know, on a default basis. It's before you get into default, yeah. you should yeah. sell the property because that's the most effective way of getting rid of the problem. Yeah, it is. And, and you can imagine why the banks are taking that view because uh, they, like you, like me, are saying, well, interest rate increases are coming down the, down, the, down the pipe. And if you can't afford your loan today... You know, how are you going to be able to afford your loan in uh, in two years' time when the rate is 
uh, 1.65, 2.15, whatever, higher? And the answer for some people is, well, we won't be able to. And uh, the bank will make that assessment. And, and if, they, if that's the assessment they're making, they'll be saying to you, look, sell now, because waiting will just mean you lose the $100,000, $150,000 equity you have in your property. Uh, so, you know, that they'll have those conversations sooner rather than later in an environment where they know it will get tougher. Absolutely. And uh, as with all of these things, don't put your head in the sand and just assume it'll be right. Don't assume that yeah. magically wage increases are going to solve the problem, right? Because these interest rate rises, when they hit, will come in, you know, like a fleet of buses. They'll come all at yeah. once, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. In relatively short order. And uh, so be prepared now. And check your rates so you know <laughs> what you, where you are and what you can do now. Start planning. <laughs> it's just nothing like a bit of planning. You get ahead of the curve. Uh, and, and, you know, you can get ahead of the curve when rates are around 2%. Uh, try getting ahead of, the, ahead of the curve when they're at 4% and your repayments have absorbed all of your extra buffer. You know, it's, it's just not possible uh, for a lot of people at that stage, whereas now is the time to do it, not to wait till you have to cut some of those discretionary things out of your budget, uh, but now when you are choosing to and we'll protect you down the track. Steve, thanks very much. Once again, very important message. And I know, you know, we keep saying, check your rate, check your rate. But guys, check your rate. It's so critical. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely is critical. And the number of people who say, oh, gee, I'm on a good rate, uh, because they're comparing it with the 8% they remember from uh, pre-GFC periods, uh, uh, is, is just, it's crazy. It's crazy. It just means they haven't looked at their rate in years. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, lack of knowledge out there that's uh, uh, yeah, building the bottom line of the bank but not helping uh, the borrower. <laughs> exactly right. Well, we should be trying to uh, protect our own finances, not the finances <laughs> of the bank. That's the main <laughs> message, I think. Steve, thanks once again. So. Always a really interesting talk with you, and uh, I'm sure we'll do it again soon. Terrific. Thanks, Martin. Thanks. Bye. Cheers.